We're going to be continuing our study in Colossians chapter 3 this evening. And uh, we're going to read the first 14 verses. And then our text will be particularly taken from verses 12 through 14. We've considered what we are to put off and uh, to put off the old man. And we shall see that when it speaks of the old man and the new man, it doesn't exclude the ladies because the old man is Adam and the new man, that which comes from Christ. And uh, that we consider this evening. In the first uh, 14 verses, we read in Colossians chapter 3. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are up, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. For which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience, in the which Ye also walked sometime when you lived in them. But now ye also put off all these, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. Lie not one to another, seeing that you put off the old man with his deeds and have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. Where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond nor free, but Christ is all and in all. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another and forgiving one another, even if any man have a quarrel with uh, against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. And above all these things, put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. Our Father, we do come before thee with the recognition that if we are to receive thy truth, that it must come from thee. It must be the work of thy spirit in us. And our Father, as we look into thy word, we ask thee to set before the sight of our soul, even by faith, the glories and the wonders of thy Son and the character of him who is altogether lovely. We ask thee, our God and our Father, to enable us to ever increase in our knowledge of our blessed Savior, for in doing so we Increase in the knowledge of thee. Teach us this night. Enable us to know what it is to put on the new man in Christ. And to live far differently than we did before coming to know thee, our God and our Father, by thy grace. We shall thank thee in the blessed name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. The old man is the old man in Adam, the Adamic nature, as we have considered, as we've looked uh, for the past few weeks into this passage. The new man is the new man in Christ. Christ in you, Paul could speak of in Colossians chapter 1. The first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam was made a quickening or life-giving spirit as Paul taught in 1 Corinthians 14, verse 15, verse 45. The new man in Christ is spiritual. 
in him who came from above. The first man is of the earth, earthy. The second man is the Lord from heaven, as in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 47. And uh, <clears throat> Paul goes on to say in regard to even the coming glorious resurrection, as we have borne the image of the earthy, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. That's a wondrous thing. Biblical Christianity, where there's genuine salvation, puts our desire toward the coming of our Lord and sees things in light of eternity, not simply in light of time, that we're moving toward that which is God's consummate purpose to bring us into conformity to his son. That's a glorious wondrous truth we're taught in scripture that of course we read in Romans 8 that we know that all things work together for good to them that love God to them who are the called according to his purpose for whom he did foreknow he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son moreover whom he did predestinate them he also called whom he called them he also justified whom he justified, them he also glorified. So if we may speak of it in this regard, there is a final phase of salvation that's coming. Salvation is glorious. It's wondrous. It's transforming. Indeed. When we come by God's grace to know his son, when we come by God's grace to be delivered from the power of darkness, and brought into God's kingdom, the kingdom of his dear son. That changes our whole perspective. We can no longer be what we were before. We can say, I'm not the man, I'm not the woman I was before coming to Christ, before coming to know him. And uh, I'm not yet what I'm going to be, but indeed by the grace of God, I am what I am. We have a blessed hope before us. We have the wondrous, glorious reality that we who are in Christ shall be forever with him. We have the, the assurance in scripture that we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. This comes under what we would consider the biblical truth of glorification. But as long as we are in this world, as long as we live in this body of flesh, still having in it what the apostle called the law of sin, which is in my members in Romans chapter seven, we're to live the new life as those who are already in the kingdom of God. We're to live under Christ as Lord, our Lord alone. We are dependent upon him to enable us to be what we are in him. There's a teaching, a method the Apostle Paul uses that is very important in Scripture. His method is, we could call it, be what you are. Live what you are in Christ. Outlive the life of Christ now in this world. You were sometimes darkness, but now are you light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. That means conduct your life now as those who are in the light of Christ, in the light of God, in the light of his kingdom in this world. If from sin you have been redeemed by the blood of Christ, and how blessed forgiveness and cleansing from sin as we're taught over and over in scripture, as in Psalm 32, blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. If you're brought by God's wondrous saving grace alone to know him, then you've been brought into his kingdom. You've been delivered from the power of darkness. You've been translated into the kingdom of God's dear son. So the new way the apostle of Christ calls us to live in relationship in our passage to one another does not constitute legal requirements. 
in order for us to obtain an acceptable righteousness with God. It's rather a call to conduct ourselves as those who are already children of God, already in Christ, already belonging to his kingdom, already with the wondrous gift of eternal life, as we're taught in Scripture. Only those who are in a genuine saving union to Jesus Christ by faith in him alone, faith alone in him, have the power to live as God's children, have the ability to live as God's children. These things, th these things were taught of that we are to be characterized by now as the new man in Christ, putting on the new man in Christ. These things cannot be rightly complied with unless we have the enablement and the grace of our God. This call to put on the new man involves not simply lustful things, outward things. We've already dealt with those. They're to be put off. It considers the way we are to treat one another. And it also involves a new estimate that we are to have of ourselves in this regard. And the way we are to react, even when ill-treated by another. That's not a natural thing, what we're taught here, the way to act when we're treated badly by someone. So we know that this is not something that we can do of ourselves. Something we can in any way derive from human nature apart from God's grace. But that ability which only comes to those who are indeed the born of God. Those who are truly his children. Those who have new life in Christ. And so as is the manner of our apostle Paul. We consider here what we would term the gospel standard. It's the gospel standard that is to govern our conduct toward each other. The gospel is the standard of our conduct under the new covenant. We're taught in Romans chapter 6, verse 14, sin shall not have dominion over you, for you're not under the law, but under grace. Well, of course, that doesn't mean we're released from walking in God's right ways and our Lord's commands, because we're taught there that we're not under the law in such a sense as to be obligated to it for a righteousness that's acceptable with God. That doesn't mean we have a license to sin. Sin shall not have dominion over you. No longer shall it be your Lord is what we're taught in Romans chapter six. The gospel brings us who are called by it to come to know the Lord Jesus Christ and his so great salvation, to come to know him. I would think that those who profess to be Christians would speak more of him, would be taken more up with the Lord Jesus himself, would desire to behold more and more the glories that belong to him, the wondrousness of his character. He who is altogether lovely, he who is fairer than 10,000, he who we're given to savor of his wondrous impurity and holiness and love. We're given to come to know him, that he is to be the one who occupies our very desires, our thoughts. And it's he who is our Lord. Moses is not our Lord. Christ. And Christ alone is our Lord. His word alone is our rule and guide. He who could say, you've heard that it hath been said of old, but I say unto you. That's supreme authority. 
that belongs to him. The gospel commission given by our Lord includes the charge teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. We read in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 19, that whosoever uh, teaches these things, they're, they're great in the kingdom. Whosoever does not teach those things that Christ is giving forth in commandment, they would be considered the least in the kingdom of heaven. The power to carry out his commands, and that including whatever we're charged by his apostles, comes when you truly, by faith alone, follow him. Follow him involves the imitation of him. It involves the being brought more and more into his character. It involves the open face that beholds him as in a glass darkly, but being changed from glory to glory, even into the image of the Lord Jesus Christ. It involves taking up your cross daily to follow him, to belong to him alone. And his apostles have the authority to give forth his commands. And whatever they command, it is sanctioned by Christ himself. That's why Paul could say in 1 Corinthians 14, 37, if any man think himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things that I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. And as believers under the new covenant, we are to come and keep coming to him coming to him alone. We're to hear what he commands. We're to endeavor always to conform ourselves to his supreme pattern. In this and in this alone, you find the grace and the power to live in accordance with God's commands. The law of God under the new covenant is not written on stone. It's written in the heart, as Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 3. It's put in our inward parts so that we have the grace to walk in accordance with his rule, the rule of our Lord himself, which was not the case under the old covenant law. For by that law, men were required to attain a righteousness that was perfect, but the law makes known no one can do so. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And under the new covenant, God puts his spirit in his people. He writes his law in the heart under the new covenant. And it's by grace. It's the grace of God that does so. That's why Paul could write in Romans 6, 14. Sin shall not have dominion over you. Not going to be your Lord. Sin shall not have dominion over you. For you're not under the law but under grace. The Lord does not give us legalistic commandments. He does not tell us to keep what he commands in order to obtain an acceptable righteousness before God. We have that in him. By grace, through faith alone, trusting him only given the very righteousness of Christ that stands us instead with God and gives us a proper standing in his sight, only that righteousness which is imputed to us through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, the righteousness of Christ put to our account, which is a wondrous thing. And so the Lord is not giving legalistic commandments in order that we may obtain a righteousness that's acceptable to God because we already are in him. We're already in his kingdom. We already have life in Christ. We have the wondrous gift of eternal life through him and in him. And this is known by faith in him alone. This makes a vast difference, of course, between the old covenant and the new covenant. The old covenant says do and live. 
The new covenant says, in essence, be what you are in Christ. Do because you live. Because you already have life in him. God saves by grace, by grace only, not by law. And when he saves by grace, it's only because of his grace that was purposed for us in Christ, even before the world began. It's out of a sovereign love that we cannot fully, it seems, sometimes take in. It is and difficult for those who've been brought under conviction for sin to see the horrendousness of it as against God. I was thinking about that today. David understood the horrendous nature of sin. He committed great evils. He committed adultery. Essentially, he committed murder. But when he's brought to profound repentance, he cries against thee, the only thy sight. This is what makes sin so huge, so horrendous. And it's difficult to take in sometimes the wondrousness that God loved us so much that he sent his son into this world to save us, to save us by taking our sins unto himself, by redeeming us, by the offering of himself. What a wondrous, glorious gospel God gives to come to know him, to trust him, to belong to him. There's nothing in this world that will ever compare to it. A wondrous God's salvation. And he calls us by the gospel. He calls us by the gospel. We come to hear and believe because of his grace. And then we hear the words, as in 1 John 3, 1. Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. So when Paul in our present passage calls us to put on the new man, it's the new man in Christ. And... The one God purposed to be in Christ. One who is holy, set apart to God through Christ crucified. The object of his special love. And only they are able to comply with what we're charged here in Colossians 3. As Paul says in verse 12. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved. Bowels of mercies, etc. So believers are to put on. And we are to develop those qualities of character. But these qualities of character are, are those characters which are exemplified in our Lord himself. We are to do so as the elect of God, holy and beloved. The regenerate, the believing, now, of course, come from all nations. They constitute a new covenant, Israel. As such, are given the status of God's chosen people. So we know that promises that were given of old belong to us. Clearly made known to us, of course, in the New Testament and in Christ and in this new covenant. We read as uh, here in verse 11, where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond nor free. But Christ is all and in all put on, therefore, as the elect of God, etc., the regenerate are in a glorious kingdom. Described in 1 Peter 2.9 as a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that you should show forth the praises of him who has called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. 
How many find it their life's goal to show forth the praise of God? To show forth the wondrousness that they're no longer their own. To outlive a life in this world that exemplifies the reality of Christ in them. This is what we're taught in scripture. If you're in Christ, you are holy. Sanctified by his blood. Sanctified in Christ Jesus. You are set apart to God. You're set apart to serve him and him only by the one eternal sacrifice of our Lord himself. And this status as God's chosen has been given because God loved you from eternity, cleansed you from sin by the blood of his son, removed all your sins from his judicial sight. That's an incredible thing. That's incredible. And we should never get over it. We remember our past sins. That was an, another old man. We're not what we were. We're now new in Christ Jesus. All of those sins put away in God's judicial sight. That's incredible. That's a wondrous manifestation of God's grace in Christ and through the cross. The one eternal redemption of our Lord that sets us apart to God. That's what holy is. To be set apart unto God himself. And he bestows upon us a love we in no wise ever could deserve. Not in the least. He loved us because it pleased him to do so. Should not we then if we comprehend something of the gloriousness, the greatness of the love of God in Christ toward us, should we not then, if God has poured his love into our hearts by his Holy Spirit, showing us the wondrousness of redemption in Christ, should we not then exhibit something of his nature? If God loved us, wrote John the Apostle in his first epistle. If God so loved us, we ought also to love one another with the very same kind of love with which he loved us. If indeed you are born of God, then, as in verse 10, you're a new creature. Your new creation, your new person in Christ. Thus, you've been renewed in knowledge after the image of Him that created you, after the image of God. And how do we know God? How do we know Him? We know Him in Christ, we know Him by, by faith. We see him in Christ, God in Christ. And as God is in Christ, we only imitate God as we follow and imitate our Lord. In Ephesians chapter 5, the Apostle Paul writes, Be ye therefore followers of God. That word followers also signifies imitators. You see that, of course, if you have a, a good concordance, like a strong concordance. And that's the best one you can have. So uh, be followers, imitators of God and walk in love as Christ also loved us and gave himself for us. That becomes the standard of the love we're to have toward one another. So all these wonderful qualities we're going to be looking at in verses 12 through 14, are in our Lord in perfection. And we are to follow him. We are to be imitators of our Lord. If Christ is in you, then the heart of Christ is in you. And if the heart of Christ is in you, 
is to govern the way you relate to each other, to other believers. And it's also to govern the way you estimate yourself, what you think about yourself, and the way you react to treatment, even ill treatment from others. We are to treat others with compassion and kindness, indeed. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, mercies, compassions. This signifies we're to have a tender heart. It's been described as an inner yearning which feels deeply for another, that moves you not only to pray for the needs of another, but to meet them, to meet their needs. Not simply to say, I'm praying for you, hope you're going to be okay, and maybe you'll get what you need to take care of some particular thing that uh, you're lacking, but we meet the need. As is said of our Lord when seeing the lost condition of men, he was moved with compassion on them. Moved with compassion. It wasn't simply that he felt. He acted out of the compassion that moved him. And when he delivered and healed the demoniac, he said to him to go to his friends and tell them how great things the Lord hath had compassion on thee. Go to them. You care about them? Go to them and tell them. Tell them about the one who healed, the one who cast out the demonic powers. Tell them about the one who delivered you from sin. Tell them about the one who redeemed you with his own blood. Tell them. Compassion, mercies toward others and toward God's children. Question, can you be the object of God's mercies and not be merciful? In Psalm 103, the psalmist says, like as a father pitieth his children. So the Lord pitieth them that fear him. For he knoweth our frame. He remembereth that we are dust. God has great mercy upon us. He has compassion for us. Then we read in 1 John chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. Hereby perceive we the love of God. How so? Because he laid down his life for us. God <laughs> laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. And immediately he says something very important. Let's see if I can quote it for you. Hereby perceive we the love of God because... He laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. And he speaks of any man have need, and we shut up our bowels of compassion from him. How dwells his love in us? How could it possibly be in us if we know his love, but we don't love? If we know the wondrousness that he has met our need, he's come to us. By his wondrous grace, brought us to himself, delivered us, promised to meet our need, and does so, and showed his love in the highest sense, gave himself for us. How could we say to one, be you filled, <laughs> and not meet their need, even though when it is costly to do so? We have to go against the whole culture of our nation to follow Christ. 
The culture of it is do what you can do for yourself. Gain everything for you. The whole advertising system is that this is something that's going to make you happy. This is something that's just going to be for you. Correct? Yet biblical Christianity says do for the other. Care for them. Care for their needs. Put on therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, kindness is doing good to others. Of course, it's the opposite of malice that wishes them ill will that we read of earlier, as in verse 8. We remember that God is kind even to the unthankful and to the evil. He makes his son to shine on the good and the evil, sends rain on the good and the evil. And then, as our estimate of ourselves, we are to be of humbleness of mind and meekness, humility and meekness is to characterize us in following the Lord Jesus Christ. Meek, humble. No one exhibited any greater humility than our Lord. We cannot comprehend the humility of he who is a divine person, who was known to be God, worshipped by the angelic creation, the second person of the triune Godhead, glorious, all things belong to him. He brought all things into existence. Glory is beyond anything we could possibly comprehend. And yet he laid it aside and took upon him the form of a servant. We can't fathom such humility. If we could transform ourselves into a worm, it wouldn't be that much humility as he exhibited. And then, not only so, but he came into this world in a great act of humility by his own volition, his own will. And then humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. He bore the greatest pain any ever did. And a greater pain of soul than the pain of body. Humility, <laughs> meek, meek. <laughs> Read the Gospels. Did he ever turn any away? Did you ever read of him turning any away? Who came to him? Oh, he tried some. He put them in the position where they must believe. But what does he say? Come unto me. All you that labor and are heavy laden. And I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I'm what? I'm meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. Pride is not going to come as a shield between you and me. Self-interest is not going to rule. I'm here to save, in essence, you would say. I am the life. I am the bread. Come and drink the water of life freely. Well, I know God works in to cause some to come to him. But if you come to him, he won't cast you out. He will never cast you out. And we keep coming to him. Because he says, I am meek and lowly in heart. 
meekness in our Lord. We come to him, though we have wronged him greatly, though we have sinned highly, though we, we ignored him, we put things that have no meaning above him. And yet, in the greatest of humility, he calls us to come to him. For I am meek and lowly in heart. Humility is the character, the quality of character that enables us to not be self-exalted, but rather to be self-demoted, if you please, in our own eyes. Paul could write, to the Romans, think not too highly of yourselves. To the Philippians, he writes in Philippians chapter 2, verse 3, let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. That's contrary to the old Adamic nature, isn't it? The old Adamic nature wants to be our own ruler. We want to be known to be something. We want to exalt ourselves. We want somebody, we want the praise of men. But we're taught that we're to put others above ourselves. And you know what? This is the kind of heart God delights in. It's the kind of heart he delights to dwell in. Thus saith the high and lofty one who inhabits eternity. I dwell in the high and holy place with him also that is a contrite and, con uh, and humble spirit. God dwells in a humble heart. And in light of him and his glory, how could we be anything but humble? Submission, submissive to him. These are godly characteristics. And a church that displays these godly characteristics will be free from the tensions that come from pride and self-assertiveness. Did you read my text today? Did you read the text I sent? The text, if I have it with them, well, never mind. If my has it with them, read the first sentence of that text. And I'll quote it. I don't have my, my phone with me. The first text I sent. What does it mean, that, that sentence? What does it mean? That's the second one. See, go back a little and find no, the first no, one. Oh, okay. Oh, when selfish and self-seeking ends govern relationship, various degrees of trouble, the inevitable outcome. Yeah, yes. When, uh, could you say that again? Uh -huh. It says, when selfish and self-seeking ends govern relationships, various degrees of trouble are the inevitable outcome. Does that sound true? Does it ring true? Indeed. Well, let me ask you a question. Did, did you read that? Everybody read that? Did you think about yourself or somebody else when you read that? What did you think about? That might say a lot about some attitude sometimes. What did you think about? You see, most of the time people put something on somebody else. Christian marriage counselors, if you hear them, the problem is always with the other. The problem is always with the other. And until there is an admission of wrong, there can be no help. We're not to exalt ourselves. We're not to lift up ourselves. 
And if we're going to have a proper relationship one to another, pride is going to have to go. Self-assertiveness is going to have to go. Meekness is the companion of a true humility. Bears insults and injuries from others without retaliating. Hey, this might be a difficult thing to consider. By nature, if someone comes against us, what is the natural inclination? Tell me. It's to hit back. It's to hit back at them. But meekness bears insults without retaliating. Is that a following of our Lord? First Peter chapter 2, verse 21 through 24. For even here and were you called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps. Who did no sin, neither was guile in his mouth, who, when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to them that judgeth righteously. To him that judgeth righteously, who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree. Meekness brings us into the way we, we are to react to the way others treat us which a true spiritual growth meets with long suffering, forbearing one another and forgiving one another, as in our passage. Those three things connect quite together. Long suffering, forbearance, forgiveness, long suffering, forbearance, forgiveness. They're quite connected together. Only the person who can suffer and bear along with people, even when ill-treated, will have a forgiving spirit. Do remember something. Do remember what our Lord told Peter. When Peter asked him, should he forgive his brother seven times? Seven times? I think there was a Jewish teaching that said, well, you forgive him three times. That's it. But Peter comes and says, seven times? You remember what the Lord told Peter? I say not unto you, not until seven times. How many times? Seventy times seven. That's a lot of forgiveness. A lot of forgiveness. Then he added the parable that taught that if we are forgiven the incredible debt we owe to God, what a debt we owe. Seeking his wondrous forgiveness, and yet we fail to forgive much smaller offenses from people, quote, so likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you, if ye from your hearts forgive not every one his brother their trespasses. Then again, what is the supreme pattern of this conduct? Verse 13 tells us, even as Christ forgave you so also do ye. You see why the gospel governs us? The gospel standard, the true following of the Lord Jesus Christ. How many of you have done these things perfectly? No hands? No, no hands? If you're truly saved by God's grace, truly forgiven, 
cleansed from all sin by the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son. And you're given by faith in Christ a right standing before God. You're a new creature. You're a new creation. Old things have passed away. All things are become new. And yet you still have to contend with the sin that dwells in your flesh. We have something we didn't have before coming to know Christ as our Lord and our blessed Savior. We have a battle. And the most horrendous thing to us is sin whenever it shows itself up. We come to hate it. To desire to be ridden from it. Having a battle with it. But then it shows up in us. Then we learn something. We're only going to be able to walk in any right way if we walk in the Spirit that is under the control of God's Holy Spirit. In Ephesians 5.18, be not drunk with wine where it is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. And of course, when one is drunk with wine, they're under the control of it. And what Paul is saying is be under the control of God's Holy Spirit. You cannot of yourself live out a true life in Christ. It's only by the work of God's grace and only by his Holy Spirit. Walk in the Spirit, Paul teaches us. And to walk in the Spirit means that you must always continually look to Christ alone. Looking unto him. Looking unto Jesus the author and finisher of your faith, trusting him only for the grace to live as he lived so that you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. And the lust of the flesh, there is not simply what some seem to think sexual immorality. It includes that. But it's even the outlashing and things by which men treat one another. If we're not yet perfect in these things, we're ever to increase in them. We're to grow not simply in knowledge. We're to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. The grace of Christ enables us to live unto him and live a different life than we lived before we came to know him. Then, that which is listed last by Paul is really the most important of all. As he says in verse 14, and above all these things put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. Well, you know what charity means in the New Testament and in our, in our authorized version. It says something about the love of God that's wondrous. Charity doesn't look for something to come from somebody else. It proceeds from one's own self. It loves irrespective of the other. Its love is not drawn by what the other does toward them. It loves because it loves. It's self-giving love. He's not simply here another garment to be added as we put on the new man. It's the quality that is to tie and bind all of these things together. The bond that cements these things. If we don't have this love in us, of course, it can only be in God's people. No one else can have this kind of love. If we don't have it, what does it say? Same thing Paul said when he wrote 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, I am become a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal, and though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, 
And though I have all faith so that I can remove mountains and have a charity, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, though I give my body to be burned and have not charity, I am what? I am nothing. He concludes, that chapter is concluded with, now abideth these three. Um, what are they? Faith, hope, charity. Which is the greatest? The greatest of these is charity. You remember what Peter wrote? If, I'm sure you've read his first epistle. If you love the word, and you're in the word. Meditate on the word. He said, charity, this kind of love, covereth a multitude of sins. That means we're going to have conflicts. That means we're going to have things that we won't like sometimes that another may be doing or doing toward us. Or, but we don't spread it. We don't want to do anything to harm their character. We become closed lip. It covers the transgression. A multitude of transgressions. What a love. What a humility. Instead of pride rising itself up, coming back against something that comes against us. Not to hit back. The Lord Jesus said, even to love your enemies. Pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. I think if we ever get back to that kind of true biblical Christianity, we might see something different taking place. In men. They might just ask, what's different about you? How is it that you're able to live a different life and Where'd that come from? And wouldn't it be wonderful if someone said that to you and you could open up the gospel to them? Say, so this is the reason. I want to point you to the one that alone is perfect in these great qualities and characteristics. And I but endeavor to follow him for he loved me. And gave himself for me. May God be pleased to, minister, uh, to bless the ministry. Of his holy word. <clears throat> we will take uh, prayer requests. I know we. Uh, we're seeing some things happening in our nation now. We don't know what will be the outcome that the Supreme Court may overturn Roe versus Wade, that doesn't mean abortion's over. It may be in some cases, in some states. It's horrendous to me to think that if anyone knew what took place in a little infant, infant that is not yet birthed, and yet they feel pain, and the horrendous way they're dealt with, little bodies torn apart, it's horrendous. It's astounding. The blood of millions of little infants are on the hands of this nation and people in it. I do pray that God would overturn that through them, but still would have a long, long way to go. Do we have special prayer requests? Of course, we want to continue praying for our people who are pretty much constantly in pain, like Bob. Uh, I haven't heard anything about John. I expect he's coming along pretty good with his recovery from surgery. We 
need to pray the Lord teach us how to follow him. Wouldn't that be a good prayer? To ever increase his knowledge in us. That he would be our vision, as we sometimes sing. That we would know the grace and work of his spirit. That we would learn to live self-sacrificially for the good of others. Mom, I will pray for myself and Barbara Lynn's husband's having surgery Tuesday. Barbara Lynn's husband's having surgery Tuesday. Surgery Tuesday. Okay. Many stand in need of God's grace and salvation. Continue to pray with Don Tracy. Pray that Tracy, or Tracy's remains would be found. Ongoing difficult situation. Bob's talking to the FBI now. Okay. Sorry? Bottas talking to the FBI now about it to help. Well, they have more resources, I think, than the local police department. And it's would. something, you know, you find out a whole lot about the politics involved in this stuff. Yeah. It's the world. They really don't care that much, you know. But John Burkett from Channel 6 has been staying in touch. And he ran the story again last night, which was very kind. Good. He's a, Bud said he's a Christian. Really? But John Burkett, yeah. I'm not familiar with him, but I hope he is. <laughs> <laughs> Pastor. My mom just got, um, she had like a little spot check on her back and they didn't think it was anything, but it did come back cancerous. So they're going to make an excision, whatever. Yeah, I think they have to check and see if there's any further. Yeah. They're going to get, take it off? Well, they did that, but then they checked it, but I think they didn't exactly. think it was cancerous, but it was. So exactly. Yeah. I assume now they're going to have to just dig a little deeper and see if it's spread anymore. Yeah. Did you have that one time? Yeah, Sherry had that. Yeah. As well. It's basal cells, so I mean, prognosis looks good. Yeah. That's a terrible word, anyway, isn't it? It is. You don't know how to pick that out today. Yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> We're going to stop the live stream so those at home can pray. And we'll pray here.